Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Intimacy and Aging, How to Support Romance Across the Lifespan, presented by Home Instead and hosted by the American Society on Aging. We will begin shortly, but before we do, a few housekeeping notes. I would like to direct you to the left side of your screen, where you will see five tabs labeled Speaker Bio, Important Information on Group Viewing, CE application here, FAQ slash troubleshoot, and event resources. The slides for today's presentation are available for download under the tab labeled event resources. You'll find information on how to obtain CE credits for this event under the CE application here tab, including links to the application and to the step-by-step -step CE guidance webpage. Please review before submitting an application. Also, please be aware that your time is logged and you must view the entire hour-long webinar to be eligible for CE credit and access the application. You will be able to access the CE application a minimum of two hours after viewing the event once attendance syncs with the application platform, although it may take up to 24 hours, so we appreciate your patience. If you are not logged into the webinar directly using the email address you registered with, then you will not be eligible for CE credit as we have no way of tracking your online attendance. If you registered before the live webinar, you will also receive a follow-up email by the end of the business day that will direct you on how to claim CEs and include links to today's slides and recording. You have 60 days from the live event date to complete a continuing education application. If you have any questions during today's presentation regarding the webinar, you can send those to us at any time using the Ask a Question box, and we will do our best to get to those questions in the last few minutes of today's programming. And now I would like to welcome our presenter. Dr. Lakeland Eichenberger is a gerontologist and caregiver advocate at Home Instead. She educates professionals in aging families and communities on the unique challenges that older adults face and the resources available to help them thrive. She has worked in the public and private sectors of senior care services and has spoken at national and international conferences on caregiving and aging, plus serves as a resource for the media. She is a board member of the National Alliance for Caregiving, board chair for the Dreamweaver Foundation, and vice chair of the Alzheimer's Association's Dementia Care Provider Roundtables. Lakeland, we're so excited to have you here with us today. Thank you so much, Victoria. Hello, everyone. I hope that you're having a great day. Uh, thank you so much for joining me for a topic that can somewhat be controversial, uh, intimacy and aging, supporting romance across the lifespan. Um, and actually, this is great timing because ASA, they um, really advocate for Ageism Awareness Day, which is this Saturday, October 7th. So I think this is a timely topic because so often our views on intimacy and aging are impacted or influenced by ageism. So again, a very timely topic, uh, and it's one that we tend to shy away from, but it's so important that we don't ignore this topic because as we age, the reality is that intimacy does play a role in people's health and well-being and their quality of life. And there is interest in intimacy that exists across the lifespan, and it should be supported in later life. Again, this sometimes is a controversial topic. It can be misunderstood in society, and therefore professionals and families can be reluctant to openly discuss it. So it's important to acknowledge that intimacy and aging is something we need to talk about. There is emotional and physical kind of implications of this topic that we're going to go into, but Intimacy takes so many forms, and we're going to talk about that. It's not just sex, uh, that three-letter three word. Uh, there is more to intimacy than that. And so regardless of uh, your age or your gender or your sexual orientation, we all have this desire for intimacy across the lifespan. And so we need to talk about ways we can best support it. Okay, so here are our objectives for today's presentation. Really, my goal is to help you to better understand the importance of this topic and help to open up uh, really just an understanding of the needs of older adults so that we can feel more comfortable 
in having these conversations and supporting intimacy across the lifespan. So no matter where you work in the long-term care continuum, uh, maybe you're a caregiver of an older adult in your life and this has been a topic you want to learn about, uh, no matter the role you play in the life of an older adult, it's important to talk about. And also, we are all aging, and so at some point, um, we will be older and we will probably still have these desires and needs for intimacy. And so we're going to talk about intimacy and the impact on quality of life. We're going to talk about how gender and sexual orientation can impact intimacy across the lifespan, along with just the immense diversity we see in the aging population. We're also going to explore common concerns related to sexual activity and aging. Um, you know, there are some uh, challenges or impacts of aging that can impact our in intimacy, so we'll talk about that. And then we're going to just provide you with some, uh, some resources, some maybe conversation starters to help you better support the families that you work with in talking about the sexual health needs of older adults. All right, so let's dive in again to this somewhat controversial topic. You know, there are a lot of cartoons and funny things out there on the internet, memes and gifts and whatnot about um, kind of this topic. And, and many of them actually promote ageism and stereotypes. Um, you, know, you know, this cartoon here on the screen says, come on, let's run upstairs and make love. And the husband says, good grief, woman, I can't do both. And you might, you know, kind of chuckle to yourself. It might be kind of a funny joke. But let's think about that. It portrays ageism, uh, perpetuates kind of that stereotype. And so, you know, it might be unintentional that people are, you know, creating these cartoons because they think they're funny. Um, but a lot of the stereotypes out there either under-sexualize older adults in, in kind of the mindset of older adults shouldn't be having sex, or it over-sexualizes older adults. You know, that terminology like the dirty old man who's always super handsy. Um, so, you know, if you think about just the way society portrays older people in sex, it really can feed into this ageism and stereotypes that we have. But, you know, think to yourself, you know, at what point in our lifespan do we shut off sexually? You know, it doesn't happen like that. That's not the reality. It's not like we turn a certain age and all of a sudden our interest in, in sex and intimacy goes away. So we need to be really cautious of these negative stereotypes. You know, every older adult is different. They have different views on sex. They have very different experiences with intimacy. Um, and so when we think about these stereotypes and ageism, it also can actually impact the way the individual sees themselves. Um, you know, a lot of aging stereotypes, they can be self-fulfilling prophecies. Someone might think to themselves, I'm too old to need or want intimacy, or, oh, it's just not appropriate for me at my age. But as I mentioned, you know, there's no expiration date for intimacy. It's something that is prevalent across the lifespan. So we really need to be mindful about how we talk about it and how these stereotypes play into it. What is encouraging to see is in popular culture, you know, media, uh, movies, there is more and more of um, a portrayal of sex among older adults and discussions about sexuality. If you think about the Netflix show uh, Grace and Frankie, um, I really enjoyed that show. Uh, you know, they created a um, age-friendly vibrator and lubricant. Uh, you know, before that, no one was really talking about that on on you know mainstream media. There's uh, the Kaminsky method uh, or movies like uh, The Book Club. Um, that's a popular one. And I think Book Club 2 is coming out soon. I haven't seen it yet. But, um, you know, they're talking about um, intimacy and aging and sex throughout the rest of our life course. And I think we're going to see more of this as the population continues to age, as we see the baby boomers enter uh, those later years of life. Popular media is going to start kind of catering more towards uh, that age group. And so I do think that we'll see um, maybe a little bit more on mainstream media about this, but also we need to be mindful of the stereotypes that might go along with that. So for today's presentation, I ask you to have a little bit of an open mind um, and try to kind of just embrace the topic for today. Again, it can kind of make us uncomfortable it even uh, makes me a little uncomfortable if I'm being honest from time to time, but it is a very important topic 
Um, and so, again, I'm just so grateful that you're here to discuss it and learn about it with me today. So let's talk about the role that sexuality and aging has and how it's largely been neglected. You know, there's not a lot of literature out there, not a lot of research on this topic, but actually ASA, uh, they put out a recent edition of their Generations magazine. You can find it online or their Generations publication, I should say, uh, and I'll have a link to it at the end of today's presentation. They had such a great variety of articles all talking about this very topic. Uh, and so I, I made sure to read that entire um, you know, Generations publication as, as I prepared for today's presentation. Um, and so I think it's great that we're having more discussions about this. But if you look at the research that's out there, a lot of it focuses on the biomedical approach to what happens physically as we age and the changes in our physical ability to be sexual or intimate. Uh, and again, it, it also uh, tends to focus more on sexual dysfunction and not at all really on pleasure. Um, and so, you know, example of this is, you know, Viagra, the little blue pill was introduced and it was a game changer for a lot of people, but it was really focused on that biomedical, you know, the function of being able to engage in sexual activity. But, um, you know, prescriptions like that can have side effects, especially for older people. It can interact with other prescriptions, um, but it really you know, while again, it addresses the kind of the functional aspect, it doesn't necessarily address the importance of intimacy um, and kind of the emotional side of it. And everyone's desire for intimacy looks different. Uh, and also for that person, it impacts their quality of life in a different way. So, um, so we need to, again, just be aware that we can't just focus on the biomedical. We can't just focus on the physical. We do have to think about the emotional uh, that goes along with it. And I think the reason why there might not be, and this is again just my thoughts, uh, why there's not a lot of maybe research on this, is that a lot of medical professionals, they might feel uncomfortable talking about it, or they might receive minimal training on how to discuss this topic with older adults. You know, um, when we think about why it is so challenging, I, I think, again, we go back to those kind of stereotypes, the biases that we have on ageism. Um, and, you know, a lot of people, maybe they no longer see themselves as sexual beings. They might not feel comfortable bringing it up to their medical provider. Um, and so this has really just led to a lack of research. So hopefully that will change. And again, kudos to ASA for uh, bringing up this topic in their recent ASA um, uh, generations publication. So I would encourage you all to go out there and listen or read. I guess it's not a podcast. I wish it was in podcast form. That would be great. Uh, but go out there and read about it. So let's talk more about sex and not just the deed of sex. There are many aspects to it. Sex is defined as a mutually voluntary activity with another person that involves sexual uh, contact. But there's also sexuality and that's an intrinsic lifelong aspect of human being. You know, when we hit puberty in our teens, we start to develop our sexuality and become aware of it. And we continue to carry that through our life. So, you know, for example, if somebody was uh, very sexual and comfortable with their sexuality in their younger years, they're likely to carry that with them into later life. And some people actually, you know, they develop more confidence in their sexuality as they grow older. They're less afraid of what other people think, um, you know, you know, just maybe more bold in their sexuality. But again, everyone is different. Every journey is different. You know, some people might be the opposite. Uh, they might have once been a very sexual being, and as they've gotten older, uh, they've kind of had those self-fulfilling stereotypes impact how they see sex and intimacy and think, you know, um, maybe I'm too old for this. Um, but as we're talking about, our desire for this does not just end uh, at one specific age. And so when we think about sexuality, it's actually made up of various components. So um, these are the circles of sexuality by Dennis Daly. Um, and in this model of sexuality, it really encompasses every aspect of our being from attitudes, 
uh, and values to feelings and experiences. And it's really influenced by the individual, family, culture, religion and spirituality, laws, professions, institutions, science and politics. I could go on and on. It's influenced by so many things. Um, and so when we look at these five circles of sexuality, it involves things like sensuality and intimacy, sexual identity, sexual health and reproduction, and sexualization. So, um, you know, again, when we talk about you know, this topic of intimacy and aging, it's not, you know, it's not cut and dry. It's not simple. Everyone is so different. Everyone's past experiences can also impact, you know, their, their current day views and uh, thoughts, beliefs, and values around sexuality. And so when we look at these, you know, various dimensions of sexuality, let's talk a little bit more about kind of the intimacy side of things. Because as I mentioned, you know, um, sex is kind of the act, but there's also this intimacy, and it can be physical or emotional. When we think about physical intimacy, we think sometimes still about the action of sex, but it doesn't have to be that type of physical intimacy. If we all think back to COVID, which I know we're all sick of talking about COVID, but you know, at that time we couldn't physically touch others. We couldn't give hugs, high fives to our friends. We couldn't handshake with our neighbors. And many people found themselves craving physical touch and realizing just how important that is. And so when you think about physical intimacy, it could be with your partner or your spouse, your significant other, but you can also share that uh, physical intim intimacy with a friend or family member. It doesn't always have to be sexual uh, or sensual. It can be those hugs, hand-holding, um, high-fiving, those handshakes. So physical intimacy, again, can look different from one person to another. And then we have emotional intimacy. And that's the dimension that allows us to feel emotions, to express emotions, both, both verbally and non-verbally. Um, and so the, the emotional intimacy for so many people, especially as we get older, they really tend to maybe value that type of emotional intimacy over the physical intimacy. Uh, and so this can be especially um, challenging once uh, an older adult loses their partner or spouse, maybe they pass away, many of them relied so heavily on that emotional intimacy that their spouse or partner provided. Especially men, they rely on their female partner for emotional intimacy in a heterosexual relationship. And a lot of women are likely to have friendships outside of their spousal relationships that provide for that emotional intimacy, whereas men are less likely to have that. So when we think about emotional intimacy, you know, the loss of a person in our life could impact our emotional intimacy. And so sometimes we see males um, after the passing of a spouse or even females engaging in a new relationship probably more quickly than maybe family or friends feel comfortable with because maybe they're lacking that emotional intimacy. Um, and so uh, they're really missing that the connection that a relationship provides. And so uh, we don't, of course, want to jump to any conclusions when those kind of situations happen, um, but we also don't want to um, you know, discount the fact that emotional intimacy is, for many, just as important, if not more important, than the physical intimacy side of things. So why, why do we talk about this? Why is it important? Um, well, Again, it's tied so closely to quality of life. You know, as the population uh, of older adults grows, it's only going to be more important. And we need to help older adults be comfortable talking about sex and sensuality and sexuality and intimacy and help them maintain these intimate connections and relationships that are important to them. Because our sexuality is, is part of who we are. And if we ignore it or remove it or treat an older person as asexual, um, you know, how does that impact um, their, their value, their self-worth? How are we treating that person? Um, are they being able to fully represent themselves in the world? If we're trying to, you know, again, impress upon them those stereotypes or ageist thoughts that, you know, older adults, 
Uh, they don't have sex, they have, don't have any interest in intimacy and those kinds of things. So we need to encourage them to be their full self regardless of their age so they can feel physical comfort, they can feel love, they can feel value, um, and they can have this be a component of their quality of life. And I think what's really interesting when we talk about relationships um, going um, into kind of these later years of life is, is we're seeing the dynamics in relationships change. You know, um, many people um, over the age of 60 have been married or are married, but as we care for people as they get into later years of their life, there, there might be more that are widows or widowers. Um, we're also seeing more divorce happening, um, you know, across the lifespan. And so some older adults, they may have had multiple uh, marriages or partners over their lifetime. Um, and so, you know, this is also something important to consider when we talk about the topic of aging and intimacy. And also we need to keep in mind that not everyone does get married or does not partner. And so we have more and more kind of solo agers. Uh, I know there's a lot of terms we could use for those that uh, are aging alone. And so we need to keep in mind how this topic impacts them as well. And then as we look at the older population, there's also a cohort that are living with a partner or companion, but they are not you know, married uh, or um, do not have kind of a formal, uh, formalized relationship. And so um, I think these are just important things to be uh, conscious of um, as we talk about um, this, this topic of, of aging and intimacy. And really, uh, this, this term gray divorce was also coined kind of, um, you know, back in 20, sorry, 2004, um, AARP had published a study on divorce at midlife and beyond, and we're seeing trends of more older adults, um, you know, entering those later years divorced um, or, um, or divorcing in their later years. And so, again, that sometimes impacts, um, you know, a person's intimacy, uh, their sexual relations, but it also opens the door for a lot uh, more of those dating commercials that you see on TV that are targeted towards the older population. Uh, I was just watching TV the other night and, and, and saw uh, one of those commercials come up, um, and, and we are seeing more and more older adults dating uh, in their later years of life. And so that opens up some really interesting discussions among families. It can be uh, maybe uncomfortable for adult children uh, when their, their aging parent or loved one starts to date. There might be some concerns. Um, and, and so again, uh, I, just another element of this conversation to keep in mind is that it might be um, challenging for families to broach these discussions um, uh, along the way. And, and I think what this all points to is really that there's such diversity in our older adult population when it comes to um, uh, this, this topic. And one uh, cohort of, of the older adult population that I wanted to be sure to touch on today was the LGBTQ community. And we know that more older adults are openly LGBT uh, and some have been open for you know most of their lifetime, while others have come out maybe later in life. And as we work with older adults, it's really important to recognize this part of the aging population and their families. And, and there are great organizations out there that support and advocate specifically for the a pardon me LGBT older adult population, such as the organization called Sage. They're the largest organization dedicated to improving the lives of LGBTQ elders. And we know that there are specific in, uh, issues that impact this population. Um, they have faced more challenges in their lifetime, such as maybe family rejection or employment discrimination, violence, and more. And, and the older LGBTQ uh, individuals might be, um, might be hesitant in some situations to, to talk about their sexuality or their sexual orientation. But I thought this was an interesting um, statistic that older individuals that are LGBT are more likely to say that society is more accepting today uh, or it's improved, whereas younger 
uh, LGBT individuals, um, they have, you know, less of that feeling. So, uh, so it could be that, you know, the younger generation, they grew up at a time where um, there is more discussion about LGBTQ and more, uh, you know, we're starting to see pride parades and those sorts of things. Um, uh, whereas, you know, older uh, LGBTQ elders might not have experienced that in their younger years. So that's my where we might see some differences. Well, let's talk a little bit more about uh, some things that might impact um, the older adult population that we work with when it comes to LGBT older adults. So there's estimated that there's 3 million older adults over the age of 50 that identify as LGBT uh, Q, but you know that number might not be accurate because some people might not, again, be openly um, uh, express, expressing this part of their sexual identity. And so uh, we do see, unfortunately, that discrimination is something um, that this cohort of older adults has experienced over their lifetime. And this could impact negatively um, the, the way that they express their sexuality and intimacy in their older years. It also could impact um, their opportunities over the lifespan when it comes to things like education, employment, housing, and stability. So, you know, what's interesting is that older adults that identify as LGBTQ, we, we do know a little bit more about them. They're twice as likely to be single and live alone. Um, they're four times as less likely to have children, so they might not have those traditional family supports as they get older. Uh, they more, they're more likely to have poverty and homelessness. They're more likely to have poor physical or mental health. Um, they might face some challenges within the healthcare system of, of um, you know, disclosing to healthcare providers or having open conversations with their healthcare providers about uh, their health. And so, you know, as again, as we think about this topic, it's really important to be mindful of the differences that exist amongst all the older adults that we work with um, and how these differences might impact their intimacy sexuality, uh, sexual experiences as they age. So I mentioned that there's not a lot of research out there, but there is some good research out there on uh, the perspectives of older adults on sex. And so the University of Michigan did a study and asked some insightful questions about older adults' perspective on sex. And so uh, this age cohort that they interviewed was between 65 and 80. Um, and regardless of, of what we think about this topic, older people are having sex. They're talking about it. Uh, they're continuing uh, as sexual beings into their older years. And most older adults, 76%, agree that sex is an important part of a romantic relationship at any age. What's interesting is that men tend to agree more often than women. You can see 84% of men agree versus 69% of women agree. And then also this research found that two in five uh, older adults indicate that they're currently sexually active, so about 40%. Um, and we do know that sexual activity does decrease with age, uh, and it could be due to, due to the fact that um, you know, the impacts of aging could um, impact our, our physical abilities to engage in sexual relationships. But again, everyone is different. We have to be careful not to group together you know, people or make too many assumptions or assume that, you know, just because uh, the person is a woman, she's less likely, or female, less likely to view sex as important than a male. Um, because, again, there's no point in life where our sexuality cuts off. Everyone's approach to this is different. Uh, some more interesting uh, information from that study. Uh, they asked participants whether or not they agree with the statement of sex is important to my quality of life overall. And over half, about 54%, agreed with this statement uh, that sex is important to overall quality of life. Again, men agreed 70%, uh, while women agreed at 40%. And then uh, they also asked those with a romantic part or those with and without romantic partners about how they view this, this statement. And those with a romantic partner were more likely than those without a romantic partner to agree with this statement. And, um, and so, again, it's important to consider you know, what contributes to quality of life. 
Some people might think, yes, sex is very important to my quality of life in older years, uh, while others may not. And so, um, you know, we need to be mindful of this in our discussions with older adults. Um, and again, try not to create these stereotypes in our minds. But we do know that aging comes with some realities that can impact our sexuality and <clears throat> intimacy and aging. And so some of these, they might make a, a lot of sense. They might seem kind of like no-brainers and then some of them might surprise you. So we know that of course, as we age, some of these changes are gradual. Uh, they take place uh, or they increase in their um, impact or severity over time. And then some things are more acute, like stroke or death of a spouse, that sort of thing. But uh, again, these are common issues that can impact um, sex and aging. So uh, first is medications. We know older adults often take multiple medications and this could impact their sexuality. It might uh, impact their ability to um, physically uh, be sexually active um, and it might impact um, them just in a variety of ways. And also, as I mentioned earlier with that example of Viagra, if, if a uh, new medication is introduced, we want to be sure it's not negatively interacting with the medications that they're already taking. We also know that some of these age-related changes happen. You know, sex hormones decrease. Women often report a lack of desire, especially, um, you know, going through menopause, there's a lot of hormonal changes. We see erectile dysfunction, um, and men are not always often uh, forthcoming in reporting erectile dysfunction, or there might be some stigma around that topic, and so might be might be something that they uh, don't feel comfortable bringing up to their healthcare provider. We also know that uh, mobility limitations and other chronic conditions can also impact um, a person's ability to possibly engage in sexual activities. Uh, you know, arthritis might cause physical elements of the act of sex to be more uncomfortable. This makes me think back again to that show, Grace and Frankie, and the, the, um, the vibrator that was created for the older adults. They talked about how, you know, it's even good for someone with arthritic hands. So if you haven't seen that show, I would highly, highly encourage you to go watch it if you're interested. We also might see couples start to experience these issues um, and they can impact, you know, the couple's sex life. It doesn't mean, you know, necessarily that um, it has to cease altogether, but, you know, especially if, if one in the couple uh, is starting to experience some changes, they might need to adapt uh, the way that they are expressing their sexuality or intimacy, um, physical, emotional, to adapt to these age-related changes. Um, and, and there was one journal article from the ASA Generations that was really interesting around this topic. It was written by a sex therapist, and she talked about how she helps couples make adjustments in their relationships as they experience some of these age-related changes. And so again, highly encourage you to go out there and to um, read that Generations art article. We also know that the use of drugs and alcohol can impact intimacy, and that's really at any age. Same with, you know, again, a loss of a partner. It can be especially hard for those that have maybe been coupled with that person for many years. Uh, they might be losing their physical and emotional intimacy. Um, and again, they might seek out a new partner uh, because, you know, uh, they're feeling that lack or that void. We also know uh, one of the issues that we sometimes see is a lack of privacy. This can be especially true in a long-term care community or when an older family member moves in with maybe their adult children or other family members. And this lack of privacy can make it challenging sometimes for a person to maintain their sexuality and intimacy. Dementia and any sort of cognitive impairment can really complicate this issue. And we're gonna talk more about this in just a bit. Uh, and then we might have to, um, you know, look at other forms of intimacy, as I mentioned. You know, not everyone remains uh, sexually active in the same way that they did when they were younger. So, you know, as a person gets older, they might be um, more inclined to um, have physical acts of intimacy like hand-holding or cuddling or kissing might be more of an important act of intimacy than maybe intercourse once was to them as a couple. And so, again, um, 
we might just need to, to shift the way that intimacy is being expressed. Also, um, there's those attitudes about aging. I feel like I've already talked about this quite a bit, but you know, uh, people might feel they're too old to have sex or talk about it. Uh, they might have that internalized ageism. Uh, they might also have religious views around um, this topic. And so, you know, um, again, we need to be mindful of, of where this person is coming from. How does their value system, how does their background influence their views on this topic as they age? I mentioned in, when I talked about privacy, um, the challenges that sometimes arise in long-term care facilities or senior living, uh, senior housing, and, and this is really complicated. Uh, I think we need to recognize that there are challenges in these types of communities. And again, I, I, I keep going back to that Generations Journal because they uh, had some great articles, and one of them highlighted the Hebrew home at Riverdale, and they were the first long-term care community to create the first in the nation's, um, uh, the nation's first sexual expression policy. And they did that back in 1995, which I think is just very progressive in this area. And you know, nursing home laws, uh, you know, they, they state and they um, require that there are, you know, some degrees of, of privacy um, for their residents. A lot of communities have a resident bill of rights but are they, um, you know, involving any sort of language about sexuality or the need for sexual expression and that sort of thing? So, um, you know, I think that this is a very important topic that uh, needs to be talked about within these communities. And on average, it's estimated that about 50% of nursing home residents are diagnosed with some form of dementia. Um, and so that can create, again, when there's cognitive impairment, some moral, ethical, and legal implications to, um, to this topic. And, and, um, and often it's something that needs to be evaluated really on a case-by-case -case basis uh, because we know that dementia, Alzheimer's, it impacts everyone very uniquely. And so we'll talk more about that again in just a bit. I think, you know, when we talk about this, long-term care communities are, I, I think it's becoming more common, but we need to continue to see them creating policies and having staff trainings on how to handle um, uh, their residents' sexuality and intimacy. You know, they need to have guiding principles um, that support this for their residents um, and, and help to make it part of the culture. And that's what that Hebrew home at Riverdale, that article talked about. It's just part of the culture. If they accidentally walk in on, uh, a staff member walks in on a resident or a re multiple residents engaging in some sort of sexual expression, they just, they don't say anything, they just close the door, walk away, and come back at a later time. They just, it's, it's just something that they want to support, and so, um, you know, making it part of the culture uh, is, is part of that. Also, for older adults that identif identify as LGBTQ, 34% of them worry about having to hide their identity when they access senior housing. Some feel like they need to go back into the closet when they move into a community because they feel like it's going to impact the care that they receive. And so, you know, we're seeing more communities, um, senior living communities that are more upfront and open about their support of, of their residents no matter their sexual orientation. Uh, and for some older adults, that is a very important decision-making factor when choosing a long-term care community. But we know in some, um, some communities, some cities, some towns, there's not a lot of options for long-term care. And so, again, that's why some older adults feel like they have to go back into the closet because the one uh, care community in their, their town does not, maybe they feel support um, people of all sexual orientations. So it's something that I think, again, needs to be addressed in the long-term care community setting and across the whole care continuum. Another important topic to bring up when we talk about intimacy and aging is sexually transmitted diseases. Um, you know, we all got those, those talks in our health classes in high school about STDs, um, but a lot of people don't consider that older adults are still at risk for sexually transmitted diseases. It's not something to ignore, and we really should be educating older adults about this. 
Um, we are seeing cases of STDs like chlamydia and gonorrhea and syphilis reach historic highs among older adults in the U.S. Uh, I know this is a little bit of an older statistic, but in 2018, over half of people in the United States diagnosed with HIV were age 50 and older. Uh, so that, that might have shifted in the last four or five years. Um, but we know that um, people sometimes lack the education around how these STDs are transmitted, and they don't realize that they can be uh, infected through oral or anal sex, uh, as well as vaginal intercourse. And so um, we need, again, to be educating about this. And, and for a lot of older adults, you know, they've been through menopause, and there's no risk of uh, pregnancy, and so they might think, oh, I don't need to use protection um, because, you know, that's really, that's really why in my younger years I really focused on, on um, you know, safe sex. But the same concept needs to apply still for older adults, you know, and those who may have not dated for many years, they might feel uncomfortable talking to their partner or talking to their healthcare professional about safe sex and about sexually transmitted diseases. Um, but again, we need to normalize this so that we, we can make sure that older adults are getting proper treatment for this. And, and one of the reasons is, is because as, as people age, they have more comorbidities. They're taking more medications. They, those meds have more side effects. Uh, and, and a lot of older adults have kind of a complicated disease management. Uh, and so if you add um, an STD to that, it can further com complicate it. Or because of the chronic conditions that they're living with, it might, they might have a weakened immune system which could in, increase the risk of contracting these types of infections. So, um, you know, again, we need to be talking about it, but at the same time, healthcare providers, they might not feel comfortable talking uh, to their patients about their sexual activity. And so uh, this could really be to the disservice um, of the older adult population and really put them at risk for improper diagnosis um, if, you know, if, if the provider's not bringing it up and the older adult's not bringing it up, again, there could be some complications that arise. So, um, you know, just like when we were in high school, we need to continue that sexual education throughout our life course um, and especially, you know, revisit it uh, in our older years um, and, or I guess instead of revisit it, continue the conversation into our older years. I've talked a little bit about cognitive impairment and some important considerations uh, for this, um, this specific uh, implication of, of, of aging. Again, not everyone who grows older will have cognitive impairment, will develop dementia, but we do know that age is the biggest risk factor for Alzheimer's and dementia. So it is a reality uh, that we need to discuss. And you know, some individuals that develop some form of dementia, they might have ch uh, changes in their sex drive. They might be um, you know, more interested in sex or less interested in sex. Uh, and sometimes because of the way dementia impacts the brain, sometimes there's a little bit of disinhibition and so they act out in a way that is labeled as sexually inappropriate. And so again, we need to take all of this into consideration. And again, there's not a lot of research in this area I found a study from back in 2007, I know that's pretty old, uh, but um, this study found that approximately 25% of those living with dementia have lost interest in sex. About 14% experienced a heightened libido. Um, and I remember watching, there's a, a documentary on Glenn Campbell, who um, passed away from Alzheimer's. Uh, he was a famous country singer, but his wife was very candid in the movie. And she mentioned that Glenn at one point had a very heightened libido and um, she, she can laugh about it now, but it was kind of a, a serious issue uh, that she needed to talk to the healthcare provider about. Um, and then 8% in this study became unable to control their sexual behavior, which may be manifested uh, in masturbation and other sex, uh, repeti repetitive sexual advances. So, um, you know, and again, sometimes people living with dementia, they're, they're acting in a way that's labeled as sexually inappropriate. Uh, I don't always think that this is a fair term. I, I sometimes like to use sexual expression because, you know, just like all of us, they still, even though they have dementia, have a desire for intimacy 
um, but it might not come out in a way that's appropriate for the environment. Uh, they might confuse one of the staff members at the community for their spouse or an adult daughter for their spouse. Uh, they might not understand that it's, it's unacceptable to um, say certain things or to touch in certain ways. And um, so we need to, in some of those situations, maybe redirect the individual. Maybe we need to kind of understand where they're coming from. Maybe they are feeling that lack of intimacy. And so finding appropriate outlets like hand-holding or uh, a gentle shoulder massage can, can kind of meet that need of theirs for that physical intimacy, but in a way that is quote unquote kind of appropriate. Um, and you also don't want to just jump to conclusions. Just because somebody um, who has dementia is acting in a certain way, there could be something else going on. You know, it could be a medication adjustment that's needed. Uh, they might be excessively touching their genitals because there's a rash or an infection, or they might be taking their clothes off because they're hot or the clothes are itchy. So I think it's important not to jump to conclusions. But one really important component of this discussion of cognitive impairment considerations is consent. And this can be really challenging. I mentioned it's a, it's a case by case basis that it really needs to be evaluated. And for somebody who has cognitive impairment, you know, we still want to respect their decision and choices. Uh, we can still educate them about safe sex, but, um, oh, pardon me, for those that do not have cognitive impairment, um, you know, we need to respect their decisions and choices and we need to educate them about their, their own decisions. And, and for those with, <clears throat> without cognitive impairment, you know, it's that, that fine line between autonomy and keeping them safe. But then when it comes to those living with co uh, cognitive impairment, this is when it really can get tricky. You know, there's not uh, a black and white answer in a lot of situations. Uh, and so sometimes we, we need to the best of our ability to, to assess the capacity based on, you know, are they able to communicate their, the choice that they're making? Do they know who their partner is that they're engaging in the activity with? If it's not their spouse, um, do they know that? Uh, are they aware of who's initiating the sexual contact? Um, are they comfortable with it? And sometimes you have to read kind of the verbal versus nonverbal cues for someone with cognitive impairment. Um, you know, do they understand the potential consequences of, of the choice? Are they able to communicate reasoning and rationale of the choice? And, and again, it's, it's such a gray area. It's so hard um, to assess if a person with cognitive impairment um, feels comfortable, even with things like hand-holding or hugging. You know, again, that, that nonverbal, that body language may be able to help provide some more context um, to the person's comfort level. And, and you know, <clears throat> somebody who maybe is in the earlier stages of, of cognitive decline, um, they might, again, be more uh, aware of the activities that they're engaging with, but as they progress through the disease, they might um, not be able to to provide kind of that consent. So an example might be, you know, if, if a wife has Alzheimer's and they're in the early, she's in the earlier stages and her and her husband are still having uh, sexual relations, uh, but she's starting to progress through the disease and she's starting not to recognize her husband and becoming fearful when he engages uh, with her in an intimate way, that's when, again, the intimacy probably needs to stop. We need to reevaluate. Are there other um, types of intimacy that can be taking place uh, that, that the wife would be comfortable with. So again, it, it is very uh, gray. It's not black and white. And, and often, uh, you may have heard um, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, uh, her husband had dementia uh, and, and developed a relationship with another woman in the memory unit that he was in. And so there's also this um, kind of challenge sometimes that families face if their loved one has cognitive decline, they are in maybe a memory care facility, and they start to engage in, you know, relationships with other residents uh, that aren't, you know, the wife or the husband, and and that can create some challenging situations. It can create some a lot of emotions for family members. Uh, and in Sandra Day O'Connor's case, she was happy that her husband had found someone in which he could enjoy companionship with. Uh, in the memory care community, but you know, not everyone's family 
is okay with that because that can create a lot of conflict and tension, uh, a lot of conversations uh, between you know the administration, the staff, the family, uh, and so forth. So uh, I want to wrap up with just some some thoughts and and tips for providers and for families on how to approach these conversations. So for providers that are out there working with older adults, um, you know, when you're talking with your, your patient or your client, um, ask them about their past sexual health. Uh, get an increased understanding of their attitudes towards it, their current situation, you know, what's normal for them. Um, are they engaging in sexual activity? And you can also, you know, be mindful um, of, you know, your words and your voice, your tone and your body language uh, when you discuss these things. You know, try not to bring your own bias. Try to check those stereotypes at the door um, and, and talk about this in a way that makes the older adult comfortable. And really understand, um, you know, these sexual issues related, again, to medication. Um, what, what was really interesting in one of the other articles in that Generations magazine, um, it, was, it was actually about how sex shops are starting to offer education on sex in your later years because older adults are not maybe comfortable talking to their healthcare provider about it or their healthcare provider is not bringing it up. And so if you are a provider and you're listening today, um, while I'm sure sex shops are a great, can be a helpful place to, to get information, uh, I think it's important for us to recognize that if their healthcare provider is not willing or able or initiating conversations about this, older adults are going to start seeking out information somewhere else. Um, and, and is that information accurate? Um, you know, of course, I think the, the example provided in the ASA journal, uh, they seem to be a well-established um, um, shop and seem to have a, a lot of great education, but that might not always be the case. Um, and so, uh, again, if they're not going to get it from their healthcare provider in terms of education, they're starting to seek out other um, options for, for learning about this topic. And then uh, for family, again, these conversations around sex and intimacy, they're tough because we want to balance autonomy uh, with responsibility. We want, we, we feel like as family, it's our job to keep our aging loved ones safe, uh, but we also want to support them. Um, and and uh, it, it's important, of course, to remember the past, but to also live in the present. And it can be really hard for families to accept new realities. For example, you know, mom is dating again after dad has passed away, or wow, um, you know, dad has another new female friend uh, and I just feel like, is he making the best decision? You know, again, it can be hard to, um, to talk about these, but again, we need to remember that, you know, to be a, a sexual being is to be a human being. It's part of uh, just our, our makeup, our DNA, and so a lot of people still want to express that into their older years. It's also important uh, to be aware of vulnerabilities. You know, we're seeing more and more romance scams um, targeted at older adults. And so I talked about that online dating earlier. We're seeing more sites for silver, silver senior dating sites and those kinds of things. Um, and, and, and we need to approach those from a place of, of, of caution. We need to make sure that, you know, they're um, not engaging in just an online relationship and spending money. We see um, 30, uh, sorry, in terms of romance scams, there's been nearly $84 million in financial loss from these. And, and it's um, just a really important issue. So if families are um, experiencing any sort of romance scam, we need to make sure that they're contacting the FBI. Um, but it can also be, again, just challenging to start the conversation that might be, you know, the first step is just starting it. Uh, but one example could be, you know, um, hey, Dad, you've been seeing Mary for a while now. You know, how is it going? Um, are, are we going to meet her sometime soon? Um, just kind of asking these questions to open up the topic uh, can just be a great place to start. Again, 
it might be uncomfortable uh, for the adult child, it might be uncomfortable for the, the parent, um, but um, again, we can kind of start to normalize the conversation. Hopefully, um, we can make this, again, normal, a normal part of aging. We can kind of de debunk the myths uh, and kick the stereotypes to the curb. Um, we have to remember, again, inside every older adult is a, a human being that has needs. Again, uh, another one of those funny, like, graphics or memes, you know, I'm still not making you a sandwich, even though he's flashing her. Um, uh, again, these can be funny, but um, before we send them on to a family member or friend, we need to remember, you know, are we contributing to kind of the ageist belief around sexuality and aging? <clears throat> Because a lot of people, I know we all work with um, older adults, and, and a lot of times you hear them say things like, well, I'm not as, uh, I don't feel as old as the number of birthday candles on my birthday cake, you know. Um, they might not feel on the inside as old as they feel on the outside. And so, uh, again, those, those lifelong desires for sexuality um, and intimacy, they, they don't, go away as we age. And for some, they might start to embrace or start to even own their sexuality as they get older. Um, again, it doesn't mean we have to stop having sex or uh, you know, cease our need for intimacy, but we can adapt uh, or help older adults adapt to new ways of intimacy um, or um, connect them with resources so that they can engage safely uh, and in a way that's comfortable for them. And again, as professionals, we have the opportunity to point them to some of these resources. So I mentioned uh, I would give you the link. This is a hype, these are all hyperlinked. So please download the slides. You can do so uh, on this webinar system. You can download the slides. Home Instead has a, an action plan for successful aging on our website. And actually a portion of it talks about how to have discussions about relationships. So that can be a helpful resource. As promised, ASA's journal, it was the winter edition, um, and they, it was entitled Sexuality and Aging, Provocative New Perspectives. And I would say that that title was very fitting. Uh, I learned so much uh, from reading that journal, uh, and I would encourage you to do so as well. Um, you know, for those that identify as LGBTQ older adults, there's great resources out there, also great resources uh, through that organization for long-term care communities and other senior uh, care providers that want to uh, be more uh, LGBTQ friendly in, in their policies, procedures, and um, that sort of thing. Um, when it comes to STD education um, and so forth, the CDC has some great resources. Um, and then there's actually an American As Association of Sexuality Educators, Counselors, and Therapists um, that you can direct individuals to if they would like to talk with a therapist or counselor about some of these issues. And then um, one of the authors from the journal was Joan Price, and she has a book um, called Naked at Our Age, Talking Out Loud About Senior Sex. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about this topic, that could be a good book to check out. Um, before I wrap up today, I did just want to put in a little plug. Um, at Home Instead, we'll be sending out a survey to ASA members uh, later this month to help us just provide a better uh, experience uh, in our work with aging uh, professionals like all of you. So uh, keep an eye out in your email. Uh, we would, it, it's all virtual, it's uh, uh, you know, something you can do online. Uh, we just really appreciate your feedback. So I just wanted to make a little plug for that. Uh, it'll be hitting your inboxes soon. Um, so with that, I know I didn't leave a lot of time for questions, but I'm gonna take a look at some of the questions that come in um, to see if there are any kind of themes that are arising. Um, you know, there's some questions about, you know, where can we go for education? Um, and I would check out some of the CDC resources um, that are out there. I'll go back to the resource page and leave that up there for a little bit. Um, I, somebody mentioned um, that The Bachelor now has the Golden Bachelor. I've seen commercials for it. Uh, and they're highlighting dating at an older age. And so we are seeing it come forth in popular culture. 
uh, most certainly. And if the bachelor is addressing it, then we know we know uh, this is a you know great step forward, I think, uh, in in conversations about dating as we get older. I haven't watched it though, so uh, I, I don't know um, if uh, if it if it's quality or not. So that is to be determined. Um, somebody brought up a really good point um, about being being a family caregiver and um, and how that changes the dynamics in in the relationship of caregiving. And um, you know, sometimes it can be hard to know how to respond to your spouse, uh, especially maybe again if they have cognitive decline. And so um, I on my on the Home Instead YouTube page, I did a um, a video on sexual expression and inappropriateness for those living with cognitive impairment. So I might be a good if you go to our YouTube page and just um, search for sexual inappropriateness, um, that video should pop up and that could potentially provide you with some more thoughts on how to handle those kinds of situations. Um, but I, I'm so sad that I've run out of time for these questions. There's so many great questions coming in. But I really want to um, thank you all for broaching this some, somewhat controversial topic with me today. Uh, I know I had a lot of information and I talk really fast, so uh, I appreciate you hanging in there with me and uh, again, just appreciate you being willing to talk about this topic. Uh, and I hope you continue on your educational journey um, by reading more about it because it's something that's going to impact us all as we continue to age. So, uh, Victoria, I'll pass it back to you. Thank you so much, uh, Lakeland. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, definitely a topic that we need to speak more about um, and get more education on. So really appreciate you bringing this um, to our audience and, and Home Instead for bringing it to our audience. And just reminding everyone um, to think about this topic, to think about, um, like you said, the memes, the shows, media, um, and whether this is reinforcing ageism or challenging it and the way that we view older adults. So really appreciate it again. Um, please be sure to check out upcoming webinars uh, with Home Instead, including Reducing Readmissions, the Top 5 Ways to Incorporate Help at Home. That's going to be happening on November for, uh, 1st. And as a reminder, please review the Step-by-Step -step CE Guidance webpage uh, to review the process before submitting an application for your certificates. This is linked on the left side of your screen under the tab labeled C application here with some more important information. Uh, you will not be able to access the CE application until a minimum of two hours after viewing this event, although it may take a little longer. So if you see a message that says failed to fetch or I have not attended and you did, uh, just give it a little bit more time to sync and, and try back the next day. Um, slides are available for download. Under the Event Resources tab, we had a few questions about the slides. Um, so they are available right now under the Event Resources tab. You can download them, but they will also be sent in the follow-up email that you should get by the end of the business day. Uh, if you have any questions about the webinar, please feel free to email ASA at info at asaging.org. And if you would like to share today's presentation with anyone, uh, the CEs are available for a full 60 days. So thank you again, Lakeland. Uh, thank you, Home Instead. And we hope you will all join us again soon. Have a great day.